well, there are there are a lot of uh, things. I'll be I'll be talking tonight on the subject of discerning Jesus. Okay, and I think it's appropriate because uh, since the outbreak of this uh, pandemic, and even when they were still debating, remember in the in the early beginnings, I think this was something like February or January, the China along with the World Health Organization came up with some uh, press release that this is not uh, contagious by human contact. And then later on they change it and they keep changing it. You, you begin to uh, get bombarded with all kinds of news. <clears throat> And so with all kinds of news like this, you begin to ask yourself, who is telling the truth? You know. Now you'll say, well, these are medical experts. These are doctors. Well, doctors are just like us in a sense. They are dependent on the information being fed to them. And so now you begin to use your better judgment <clears throat> And when you do, you wonder whether you have a better judgment or not. Incidentally, that is the same, but there is, of course, a truth. Incidentally, that is the same as our relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, last week, we talked about following Jesus. So, for tonight, I would like to discuss this subject on discerning Jesus. Okay? Discerning Jesus. Because the Jesus that I serve, that you serve, that we serve, the moment other people describe them, it sounds like a different Jesus. Think of it this way. For some denominations, for some religious circles, Jesus doesn't heal anymore. By the way, there is this Reformed pastor, the uh, name of, uh, is it Francis Chan, John, or is John? Where's John? He's sleeping. Uh, I think it's uh, Francis, Francis Chan. He doesn't believe in healing. He's a reformed graduate. And so he doesn't preach that. He ministered to the Skid Row in California. Very strong in missions. I think he resigned from his church. And then I think this month he came up with an article saying, I believe in miracles. Yeah. He suddenly now believed in miracles, in the gifts of the Spirit. He believed in healing. The reason is, he said, that is what I was taught in the seminary. Now, here is a guy who went to a prestigious school, and he was taught in the seminary that Jesus doesn't heal anymore, that the gifts of the Spirit had stopped, and that there are no more miracles. And so he preached, he basically echoed the same thing. Now he got himself associated with uh, John. It's uh, Francis Chan, right? Yeah. Um, he got himself associated with some missionaries who are of Pentecostal origin or persuasion. And perhaps he began to see some miracles. And he began to say, wait a minute. What I was taught in the seminary is not true. And so <clears throat> he changed his view and came up with an article. And nobody can deny him because he's a very famous uh, pastor in California. And so, the Jesus that he used to preach is not the same Jesus that now he knows. You see? And so, it, it behooves us to really look at the scripture to begin to discern who this Jesus is. Now, the importance of this is in looking at the times today. If we don't discern what is going on, we will just be taken along with every wind of news that comes along the way. Specifically, for example, uh, a good illustration will be the COVID-19. This needs a lot of discerning. Okay. Governor Whitmer of uh, Michigan said that there should be social distancing. He, he locked down his, her constituency longer than others. And then the protest took place. He participated in the protest. So what happened to social distancing? They know something we didn't know. How about the Blasio of New York? 
saying that churches cannot meet, but the protesters are exempted. Somebody is lying to us. Somebody is not telling us the truth. Last week, who came up with a study that says all of these things that we are told are basically wrong? Masks are not needed. That's what who said. And uh, the social distancing are not that effective. The World Health Organization, remember Trump is pressuring them because Trump withdrew the $400,000. And he said, these are the findings. And he said, there are no relapse. All the countries that, that opened earlier, no relapse. And they said, well, essentially the lockdown should not have taken place. Couple of days after that, who recounted everything? <laughs> but said all our findings are still true. Which means they have been pressured politically. Which now begs this question, who is telling the truth? By the way, did you see yesterday the uh, town hall meeting? I don't know if you can call it a symposium that Trump held in Dallas, Texas. You should be watching this kind of news, you know. If you listen to only to CNN, you're stuck. Uh, because anything that Trump says, or the conservative says, they will oppose. Trump made a mistake. He should have said he's opening the country December 1999, you know, uh, or 2019, rather, so that they will have moved it to uh, June. Everything that he says, they just oppose. But look at that town hall meeting. The social distancing. Trump is sitting beside two ministers. The chairs were just moved a little bit, and then the others are one chair apart. And nobody in the crowd was wearing a mask. I was looking at that and said, somebody is lying to us. Somebody is not telling us the truth. And, and, and you have seen the, the protesters. They are being supported by politicians. There is no social distancing there. What happened to it? Suddenly our subject of discussion are the protests. What happened? Somebody is lying to us. And so if we don't know how to discern the times, now these are times, I, saw, I said this before, times of deception. People are, are going to uh, lie about everything. You, you know this, some people lie to your face all the time. It's the spirit of the times. And so we have to be very discerning as to uh, what kind of information we are allowing or we are sifting through. Otherwise, we will become victims. Now, the death of George Floyd. Understand what's the difference between constitutional protest and all of these killings and looting. That's not protest anymore. And look at that. By the way, have you seen the audio of uh, the alderman of Chicago and Mayor Lightfoot? Have you seen that? What have you guys been watching? Uh, an alderman leaked an audio conversation, because they are all recorded, between Lightfoot and the 50 aldermen of Chicago. They were cursing each other. They had no idea what they're doing. Our mayor, our alderman. One alderman was crying out, I've got over 100 uh, National Guard waiting to be to be deployed. What are we doing? I mean, they're, they're just cursing each other out. And so it, 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 uh, the news went out. So this, today, Lightfoot went out and was very upset with that leaked audio. They are lying to us. Huh. Uh, and so we had to be very discerning as to uh, what type of information. Now, you already know that Facebook is basically anti-conservative, pro Pro, uh, progressive, uh, very anti-Christian. Twitter is the same. Uh, YouTube, what? Instagram is the same. And so you have to be very careful what you uh, read from these uh, outlets of information. Now the same can be said regarding our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now. In all of this, Jesus, God, religion, and our discussion was never mentioned, but, but I was very impressed yesterday with this town hall meeting in Dallas 
because for the first time, a person, I don't know if he's a minister or what, or a businessman, he said this, a black guy. He said, he said Mr. President, and he, he was addressing the American people, he said, and I was very happy, my ears were clapping when he said this. He said, what the U.S. need is the fear of God. By the way, have you, have you guys uh, used stream.org as uh, your homepage or it's still CNN? Um, today, a few hours ago, who is this General, General uh, Flynn? Came up with an article. It's a very good article. He is basically telling that America should return to God. Should, should, this is Michael Flynn, the three-star general. He's basically saying America should return to God. We should, these are our values. These are our foundation. When I read that, I, I, it, it, it sounded like I was reading a, an article written by a minister, not by a three-star general. No wonder he was very successful. Is it? That's why we have to be very discerning as to what's getting in here and what's getting in our hearts because that will affect and alter your behavior. By the way, if during this uh, COVID-19 lockdown you have focused your attention on God, you would have known Him better. We have a member calling me last week. He was very happy. He said, Pastor, say, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. During this lockdown, you know, he was, he was praying and, and the Lord blessed him with, even with the sign of his speaking in other tongues. That's in, the, in, in this lockdown, you see. But some of you perhaps have focused on, 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 on Facebook, so you have major on gossip. You have, you have uh, remember what I'm telling you, the moment you let these things touch you, it's a leaven that touch you. Don't say you are exempted. Nobody is. Uh, if you major on gossip, you, you became tainted with it. But I was very blessed because this member of ours said that I received the fullness of the Spirit during this pandemic. When I heard that, I was rejoicing and I called him back and I said, I'm very happy with you. And, and he's pressing on with God. That's what we need. What we need is uh, to really press on the Lord in this time and begin to get to know him. Not through our religious eyes or what some religious leaders say, but what the Bible says. Biblically, if our attitudes are correct, it should point us to God who alone has the answer. In our church in the Philippines, big neon lights, influence of South Korea. Christ is the answer. And so Oral Roberts went to the Philippines and the then president, I think Makapagal or Ramon Magsaysay welcomed Oral Roberts in the, in, the, uh, in the Malacanang Palace and said this, it was in the headlines, it's in the archives, Manila Bulletin. It says, he told Oral Roberts, Evangelist Oral Roberts, in the Philippines, Christ is the answer. You see? That's what he said. It's in the headlines. You can, you can read it in the, in the National Archives of the Philippines. In this country, Christ is the answer. That was in the 60s. And today, of course, Islam is spreading in the Philippines. Same-sex marriage is, and homosexuality is rampant now. Living in, outside of marriage, having sex without marriage is very popular now. What happened to in the Philippines, Christ is the answer. Somebody started giving wrong information about Jesus and his word. Some pastors start saying, it is okay to live an, a deviant lifestyle and lo God loves you. you know, and, and everything is going to be okay. Somebody is lying. Somebody had <laughs> forgotten what the true gospel is. So here are common understanding of who Jesus is, let's start it in his time. How do, they, how do the people perceive Jesus? Well, for some, he is just an ordinary son of Mary and Joseph. In fact, the gossip, it's not a gossip, but the gossip that went around to slide, slide Mary is, he's the adopted son of, of Joseph because he is the child out of wedlock. Either he came from Joseph or he came from another man. These are the kind of gossip 
that was going on in the times of Jesus. Some people say he is the oldest brother of his siblings, at least three brothers and two sisters, or four brothers and two sisters. Some people say he is a teacher, a rabbi, or a religious fanatic. That's what they're saying about Jesus. Some call him the miracle worker. That's why Herod, upon meeting him, was very eager to have him do miracles. Some, some people say he's one of the prophets of a long time ago. That's when Jesus asked the disciples, who do, say, who do you think I am? And Peter, on behalf of the other apostles, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, this is the early common understanding of who Jesus is. Some people say he's the son of the carpenter. Okay? Now, here are, by the way, today, a lot of people still believe in the same way. If you ask a street person, who they believe Jesus is, one of these or more than one of these will be their answer. There are some early revelations though. These are knowledge of Jesus by revelation. Number one, he is the king of the Jews. It came from the wise men from the east. Okay, it came from the wise men from the east. He is the king of the Jews. Where is this king of the Jews? Suddenly, Herod was alarmed and the religious leaders were called as to where the king of the Jews will be born. Well, this is a message from the angel. He is the Savior, the Messiah. This is the angelic message to the shepherds on the field. Some of you who, who went with me to Israel last February from that uh, mall, you were shown where the field is that probably uh, hosted the shepherds. Can you imagine? These are now the angels. Today, a Savior, the Messiah, is born to you today. What happened to those shepherds? Were they among those who followed Jesus? Or they just forget about it? Because some people will receive revelation of who Jesus is and just forget about it. The message of an angel to Mary. He will save his people from their sin. This is Jesus according to an angel. He will save his people from their sin. Revelatory knowledge. Another message. His name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. No, he's 100% man. But the angel says he's Emmanuel, God with us. You have Jesus, you have God. Nicodemus told Jesus, we know you are from God. This is by revelation. He must be from God, sent by God. Nicodemus, early on, during that uh, midnight visit to Jesus, gave that revelation. Now, all of those things, among many others, are understanding and revelation about Jesus. The issue is, how about the disciples? How do they understand him? How do they discern him? How about us today? Now, we can apply this simply. For example, uh, Eliza or Eliza or whatever, however you want to be called. Who is she? You don't know who she is. Eliza. So who is she, DJ? So, you call her your friend. Who is she to you? No. Huh? Who are you? <laughs> A sister in Christ. Yeah. How do you think does her mother look at her? A daughter. You see what I'm talking about? But now you ask the question, how does God look at her? If how the parents look at her and how you guys look at her contradict how God looks at her, then what is the meaning of that difference? The difference is what your behavior will be towards her. Okay. The difference. That's how you will behave uh, towards her. So, that's knowledge. How we look at each other affects our attitudes, uh, affects the way we treat each other, affects the way we receive each other's words. For some people, somebody will be speaking and you don't pay attention. There is no weight in those people's words. For some people, you will listen. So let's focus it now on Jesus. 
Even though we claim to be born again, we are Christians. Can you discern Jesus in our midst today? And who is he to you? Let's look at Matthew chapter 17. Now, this was uh, before Jesus uh, was crucified, okay? Okay. <clears throat> 17 verse 1, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Today it's called the mountain of transfiguration. He was transfigured in front of them and his face shone like the sun. By the way, you see this, right? He was transfigured before all of them. One of the questions that, that you should readily ask is this. When he was transfigured, was he transfigured as a man? Or was he God? Very important question. Because it will affect your interpretation of Philippians. He set aside deity. If he set aside, how was he transfigured? What was he showing them? Is, it, is he showing God? Or is, is he showing what a man should look like? You see? These are important questions you should be asking. Because he was transfigured before them. And then suddenly, it was gone. Now, was he transfigured? Or were the disciples allowed to see who the second Adam really is? You see, his flesh becomes like a curtain that covers who he is. Okay? He was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking to him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. They still recognize him. His face shone. His clothes were as white. Uh, Mark translation translates uh, like it was just newly washed by a laundry man. Not a laundry woman, but a laundry man. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you want, I will set up three shelters here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Some translation, three, three tenths. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they felt face down and were terrified. Jesus came up, touched them, and said, Get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down, the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they didn't recognize him. Look at this. They didn't recognize him. This is John the Baptist. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at, at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Now, segue a little bit. Look at John the Baptist. Who do they see? A reed blown here and there? A man dressed in camel's hair? Now, Jesus said it here. If you can accept it, he is Elijah. No, we know he's not Elijah, but he is Elijah. Elijah being the harbinger of the Messiah, the front runner of the Messiah. A fulfillment of Malachi chapter, chapter 3, something like that. Or chapter 4. A fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4. Jesus said, he is Elijah. Or they say it's figure of speech. He is the spirit of Elijah. Okay? Or like Elijah the prophet. My harbinger, my, fore, my, my forerunner. But they never saw him that way. But Jesus had always looked at the Baptist as Elijah. So we were looking at the Baptist differently. No wonder the way Jesus behaved, behaved towards John the Baptist is different towards the other disciples. 
and the other people how they they even beheaded him. They never saw him as Elijah. Because had they known he is Elijah in the eyes of God, they would not have beheaded him. Because you touch Elijah in the old days, God will touch you. Something wrong will, will happen to you. And so they, they never saw it that way. This is commonly known, that passage, as the transfiguration of Jesus before his three disciples. Well, he was accompanied later on by Moses and Elijah. Now, all the, all the time people had seen Jesus, just a man with no previous existence and no status with God. However, in the transfiguration, we found out that all their understanding fell short. By the way, look at this. I'll throw this to you guys. Okay? His face glitters. His dress white. Have you seen this before? In the Bible? Mount what? To whom? Did Moses, right? Now, when, when the face of Moses glittered, was Moses glorified? Huh? Because sometimes we look at this and say, oh, that's God. No, the face of Moses glittered. Now, I, I suspect that the brightness of the face of Jesus was more than Moses. Why? Because continuous continuous uh, exposure of Moses to the presence of God twice per 40 days. Continuous exposure. He started reflecting the glory of God. How about Jesus? He is 24-7 exposed to the presence of Jesus, of, of God himself. And so, his face glittered. You are looking a, a prophet like Moses. What about his clothes? Have you seen this before? So Moses demonstrated the face without being glorified. Because some people say, well, Jesus saw his glory. No, he can't be glorified. The reason why he can't be glorified, he did not die yet. But exposure to the presence of God 24-7, I mean, before he was even born, that was revealed. What about the, the clothes? Have you seen that before? Huh? Perhaps in the Garden of Eden. Perhaps in the Garden. Remember we have been saying that you have crowned him with glory in the book of Psalms? And then the rabbis wrote that actually Adam and Eve wore that glory clothing like a scale. It's bright light. So now, if that is the case, what are we seeing here? Perhaps what we are seeing is how the first Adam looked like. Now, this is the second Adam. This is an amazing sight. Je some, I have read books that says, this is Jesus in glorified form. He, it cannot be glorified form. He did not die yet. People are forgetting. He, and if it's glorified form, it will not die anymore. It died. It, it died sometime later. It died. Why? He was crucified. It died. So it's not glorified yet. Now, you will begin to understand how you and I will look like that the moment our body is glorified. But this is a non-glorified form because the body is still died. That's why when people begin to be exposed to the presence of God, glory things happen. You know, just glorious things happen. There, there are books that you can read on testimonies on how people were able to expose themselves in the presence of God in an extended period of time, and they literally shine. You know, literally they shine. This is an amazing thing that God is doing among people. So in the transfiguration, Jesus allowed them to see beyond his flesh. He allowed them to see what the second Adam probably looked like. And I'm convinced that's how the first Adam looked like. Of all the knowledge that they have on who Jesus is, the Father is spoke as to who Jesus is. This is what the Father says. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, everybody looks at Jesus as the healer, as uh, somebody who multiplies the bread, did the following things. But you ask God, 
Father, how do you look at Jesus? This is what he said. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Wow. Now, can you, have you ever imagined God looking at you like that? Now, remember, God loves us the way he loves Jesus. And the righteousness of Jesus was given to us. Can you imagine if that is what, is, and I believe it is, that is what is in the heart of God when he looks at us. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Maybe some of us will not see it that way. But what if that is what God wants? Okay. So for the first time with this, with this three, they were able to discern some things about Jesus that we should take note of. And Jesus said, this, hey, listen, don't tell anybody yet until I am risen from the dead. Don't tell anybody. So, so meaning even, even Jesus himself refused to reveal this aspect of who he is. Now, I'm repeating this. This is not glorified body because it died. This is just a man immersed in the presence of God. You know. I, I, bought a, uh, I bought a truck. And when Anne went inside, she said, what a smell. She said, it smells like cigarette. Because the, the previous owner smell, uh, smoked cigarette a lot. I said, no, it's not cigarette. It's the combination of cigarette and this, uh, how do you call that, the one that smells? Air freshener. I said, the, the, I mean, the, the, the odor is stays. To this day, it is stays. Why did it stays? Because for years, it has been exposed to a man with a chimney in his mouth. And so it will take a lot uh, of, of uh, cleaning and care. It's, it's slowly, it's slowly the smell is going away, but it stays there. How does a man who is constantly exposed in the presence of God, it smells like? Last week, we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. It will give you an idea. Now, this is, this, is, this is now God telling us who Jesus is in His sight. And, and I, would, I would suggest, if we are going to discern Jesus among us, this is how we should look at Him. Number one, He is God's beloved Son. When applied to God, the word love is is uh, referring to a person's relationship, okay? When you love a person, not only do you love the person, you love his word. This is my beloved son. A very personal love that the father is expressing towards the son. I have a friend, a minister. I know if he's still alive. I have not seen him in years. But I had him preach in our church years ago, the old church. And his son was uh, divorced by his wife in America. And, and we, were both, we were both conservative, so. I asked him, so what happened to, because his son was my student. I said, what happened to your, to your son? He said, oh, brother. He calls me brother. And the way he, he I, I like it, the, the way he calls me, oh, brother. The way he says brother, <laughs> you will feel like you're a brother. You know? He said, oh, brother, he said. Very humble man. He used to, he used to uh, work for John Austin, with John Austin. He said, oh, brother, he said, something bad happened to my son. He got married. And the wife cheated on him. And the wife divorced him. The wife is the guilty party. I said, really? So I said, what is he doing now? He said, he, he's going to take over the church that I had and the ministry. I said, really? And when I said, really, it's because we have the same standard before. And he looked at me and said, Brother, I know what you're thinking. And I know what the Bible says. Then he said this. Very few people said it the way he said it. He said, I know. And then he said this. But he is my son. He told me. And I, when he said to me, but he is my son. 
I, I felt it inside when he said, but he is my son. He said, I will help him. I will help him recover. I will, have, I will help him get back on his feet. He is my son. When he said that, I said, uh, brother, anything I can do to help, please let me know. And he said, oh, I'm glad you said that. He said, he is my son. Like, like it's, it's coming from his heart. He is my son. You know? Now, can you imagine the amount of criticism that his son received? But then he said, he is my son. He has been taken advantage of. He has been maligned. But he is my son. Now, can you imagine that pertaining to Jesus? People who want to kill him. The priests who uses his name. Bad mouth him. They call him demon possessed. They call him his Beelzebub. And now for the first time, the disciples heard, this is my beloved son. Now listen to that. The people whom even today are uh, bad-mouthing, the people whom even today are misrepresenting, you ask God, discern it properly. Jesus is God's beloved son. Now love in the Old Testament involves not rigidity but spontaneous feeling when you love somebody in the old testament you give yourself okay there's there's an there's there's an element of self-giving and it involves doing activities that is pleasant or pleasing meaning god is saying oh this is my beloved son i do things with him that pleases me okay when when god loves somebody he invites them to do something that is pleasant. Now, let's apply it to us. Do you believe God loves you? <clears throat> Man, let me drink a little bit, okay? Do you believe God loves you? If God loves you and you believe it, then it follows from this definition of love that God wants to do some things, some things with you that are pleasant or favorable. Therefore, any activities you do that are not pleasant or pleasing to Him is not with Him. What's, what He is saying is you are doing things that are not in line with being beloved of God. Now, when that, when that self-giving and doing pleasant activities work together, it involves activities like worship. Worship is one of those activities. When you love God, you worship. That's why the gathering of the saints, if we love one another, if we, if we love God, we gather to do something that pleases Him. It includes worship. It includes loving one another. The moment you look at it this way, a lot of what we do, a lot of our activities are not really pleasing and uh, are not really towards loving one another. Now, <clears throat> this is also a very passionate love that is full of fervor. This, is, this love in the Old Testament is used not only for, between husbands and wives, but between friends, between siblings, between parents and their children and between committed leaders. This is, this is the kind of love that, that exists. The second thing, this is my beloved son. And this is how we should discern Jesus. He's God's beloved son. Second, Jesus is the one that we should, that we should be listening to. Listen to him. It's amazing that in this revelation, no discussion was offered on the religious community going after Jesus. He didn't say, listen to him after it's verified by the religious community. Just listen to him. He is the one whom I love. I love his words. Listen to him. When God loves you and demonstrates his love towards you, he enjoins others to listen to you. Okay? And you will, you'll find that in, in the scriptures. Listen to what he said. You know, you will find those 
his statements from the scriptures. Moses and Elijah, two of the most prominent figures in the Old Testament, were speaking with Jesus. This brings me to this thought. If our leaders who thought highly of themselves and their role in their respective communities, they should be talking to Jesus about what ails this world. Yeah. By the way, you read a little bit, <clears throat> history of the U.S. I forgot what value was that. You know, the crossing that, uh, that George Washington did that turned the war around. If you read the history, the first presence of the U.S. during times of crisis, they often find this Anglican general, George Washington, uh, they open, often find him on his knees, praying before God. Yeah. Now this is, this is, I think, what a subject of prayer in, in, this, in this pandemic, in this uh, crisis that the world went through. How many leaders of the world have you seen turn to God? I, I cannot say that the Speaker of the House turned to God. He did not turn to God. I, I, I wouldn't even say that the Senate President turned to God, Ms. McConnell. I don't see him turning to God. Uh, do you see our mayor here turn to God? Certainly, some of, our, some of our leaders don't even care about God. They would like to shut down the church for an extended period of time. Maybe they want to shut down the church until the election is over. But this is, this is missing. And, and they were discussing to Jesus the affairs of Israel. And they were talking to him. We, we should really uh, go, to, go to the page of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. There is a prayer there that he offered to the Lord. And he said, look, look at it. It's a prayer that we can learn from. Basically, he was praying for godly leaders to be around us and for God to remove ungodly leaders. By the way, that is a biblical prayer. We Christians, although November is still several months away, we, sh we, sh we should drop parties. We should be praying for God-fearing leaders to be leading the U.S., if you will discern what's going on in this right now, for goodness sake, they have six blocks in Shuttle. Shuttle is one of the most progressive uh, cities that we have in the U.S. It's, it is the seat, it is the Silicon, where the Silicon Valley is. Some, some of the multi-billionaires by this, by this Silicon Valley business came from there. Bill Gates uh, came from there. These people don't believe in God. And now you have six city blocks occupied. Basically what this is, is rebellion. This is unconstitutional. But we have sitting mayors, sitting governors supporting it. But not only that, they are trying to duplicate the same thing right now in Portland, Oregon. Remember Portland years ago, after 9-1-1? It is the first city in America that sued the FBI. So there will be no uh, bugging of the phones. And, and for, some, for some news years ago, a lot of, a lot of uh, unlikely characters moved to Portland. The FBI is not allowed to do surveillance in Portland. It was a legal case during the times of uh, George Bush, the second. And they won. And now they are trying to duplicate. Look, look at this. And then listen to the audio that was leaked by one of our aldermen. Our, our mayor, along with the 50 aldermen in a conference call, they're just cursing each other. These are our leaders. In, in front of the camera, they pretend to know what they're doing. They're in a mess. They don't know what they're doing. We should, we should be praying 
how we should be praying that we will have leaders who will have understanding of these times. This, this, is, this is my concern. It has been prophesied that uh, socialism will die in America. But the signs are not there. They, they are thriving. They are increasing. Now, understand this with me. Say Trump is re-elected. That's just for more years. He is very pa patriotic. He wants to uphold law and order. What will happen? Everybody is opposing him. Uh, the mayors, the governors are saying he has no power over cities and, and states. What kind of garbage is that? <laughs> He's the president. He's got an overall authority over the whole country. Because they don't want him in. And so if, if we are, if we are uh, discerning Americans, th these are items of prayer that we should really bring to God. We need godly leaders more than ever. We really need godly leaders. We really need them. Because even our religious leaders, they don't want him. Of course, there's a big block that supports him, but they don't want him. Those who are always in the news, they don't want him. This is not good for our country. And so, we need Jesus for America at this time. We need him for America. And he is the one that the Father says, listen to him. Now, when the disciples heard the voice of the Father concerning Jesus, they were, look at this, they were terrified. Now, this, how did the disciples apply this knowledge of Jesus during his arrest and execution? They just saw him with glittering face, with very bright white uh, clothes. What happened when he was arrested? They ran away from him. They ran away from him. Two of the most important questions in the Bible, in the Gospels, who do men say I am? That's the first most important question. Who do men say I am? What is the second most important question? It was, it was, uh, it was issued by Pilate. What do I do with him? How we perceive Jesus is how we will behave towards him. That's why, for example, when you disrespect Jesus, when you ignore his word, that tells you how you perceive him. Two most important questions. Who do men say I am? Second most important question, what do I do with him? Who you say he is, is how you deal with him. Okay? Now let's apply this <clears throat> revelation of Jesus to our situations. By the way, you know that there's no more curfew, right? So we can go up to nine. I will, I will no longer be concerned that the police will stop you. Look at verse 14. When they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son because he has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long must, must, must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out, Jesus, because of your little faith? He told them, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, Move from here to there, and, and it, will, it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. You have little faith. Now you have to ask the question, Little faith on whom or on what? They have little faith on Jesus. Jesus' priorities have already commanded them that they could cast out demons, they can heal the sick, they can do the following things. They have little faith in those words. Look, this incident at the foot of the mountain. The three disciples just saw Jesus, uh, bright face uh, and bright, bright clothing. Why is it that when they went down, they did not, none, of them, none of these three volunteered? We'll cast out the demons. We have just seen Jesus. It never got in their spirit. That's why they ran away when he was arrested. It is possible for us to receive a revelation of who Jesus is and never gets it. How come Mary said this? He is beside himself. She got an angelic visitation. She knew that she had never known a man and Jesus was conceived. How come at one point she thought Jesus was crazy? Because the whole revelation 
never got into here yet. That is the same with us. Okay? You know how people's ministries and lives turn around the moment they see who Jesus is. Till Osborne was a failed Assemblies of God missionary to India. He stayed in India for two years, could not win a soul. He was very frustrated. He was one of those idealistic young ministers. I'm going to go to India. I'm going to go to Africa. I'm going to convert the whole continent or the whole country. He went there, was preaching for two years, never won a soul. Came back to America, very frustrated. So he told his wife, I will not leave my room until I get the answer. Got a pitcher of water. He was going to fast for as long as he needs to to get the answer. And he said, for us, uh, the, almost the moment I, I dropped on my knees, Jesus appeared to him. And said, Jesus never said anything to him. But he said, Jesus appeared to me in bright light, just like this. He said, he was just looking at me. And people ask, tell us, why did he say nothing? He said, he was just looking at me. He said, but when, when I look, look at the eyes of Jesus, that's the Son of God. He is risen from the, He is real. And the moment it got into him that he is real, he can pray for the sick and get them healed. That changed him. That changed. He got a revelation of Jesus. You know why we operate in fear? We don't know Jesus. Because one of the messages that he always tells, fear now. I'm telling you, this, this COVID displayed a lot of fear from a lot of us. You know. And at one time, my wife was very angry with me. Uh, I'm, I'm running here and there, you know. And she said, okay. Yabang mo naman. No, I'm just not afraid. This is, and I'm not saying that, that uh, to say that I have more faith than you. No, God just took it away. I was, I was asking God about that and just took it away. I have no fear of COVID. The Lord just took it away. Oh, but man, I'm telling you, a lot of fear is demonstrated even from a lot of Christians. Does this tell us that we are not discerning Jesus properly? Remember when Jesus was healing the sick, in fact, at, at one time raising the dead, everybody was afraid. And, and Jesus said, just fear not. She's, she's alive. I'm telling you, this, this pandemic, this lockdown, should have brought us closer to Jesus. It should, it should have allowed us to see where our faith is. Now, get to think about this. If Jesus is here, what would he tell us? All this is scare thing, right, that happened. Uh, people panic buying. And some of us panic, panic buy. I'm not condemning anybody, but some people just panic buy. Uh, we, we did not. Because panic buying is regular to my wife. Every time you see her buy, like, she's not going to go back to the store anymore, you know. That's before the pandemic. Now think, think, what if Jesus is here and saw you panic buying? What would he say? I think he will say, hey, fear not. Fear not, little girl or little boy. I'll provide. Right? Can you imagine some, some of us who lost our job, who got infected, for example, what would you say? Oh, I guess for some of you, the way you saw Jesus, Jesus said, hey, don't talk to me. But Jesus would have said, fear not. Now, you heard me from the live streaming uh, practice, the precautions, but I'm telling you, with all of the news I've read, I have serious doubt those leaders talking know what they're talking about because they keep changing their statements. And people are being swayed by whatever they say. 
It's about time that we really listen to Jesus and ask him, what would he say about this situation? You see? And, and the father says, listen to him. The same thing happened to uh, Kent e. Hagen. He was dying. I think during his time there were only two of them with uh, degenerative heart disease. He was supposed to die very young. And he said the doctor gave him up already. And he was given the Bible and was reading it. And then before he died, he was dying, he saw himself going to the abyss. And Jesus appeared to him. And said, you're going to preach? Took the fear out of him. And, and, and boy, the way he preached faith. If you, if you, if you look at Ken Hagen, the way he ministered, the one who got that revelation first is E.W. Kenyon. Every teaching that, that uh, you hear from Kent E. Hagen, you can hear it from E.W. Kenyon. But the, the, the difference in power is massive. Why? Because E.W. Kenyon never saw Jesus. Kent E. Hagen saw Jesus in multiple times. And so his faith is, is very different. His, his faith is very different. The people whom I have talked to who know Kent Hagen personally told me this. When he calls you into his office, he said, you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. I've, I've, uh, I've heard preacher who had encountered with him. He said, this guy is so close to Jesus. He's into Jesus 100%. He said, he will, he will just be look, looking at you, joking, and then the next meeting, prophesying. Telling what your concerns are. Now, can you imagine till, uh, who is this, uh, Oral, Oral Roberts? He was dying. He was, he was very old. When he was dying, the anointing healing is still on him. When he was dying, a mother and daughter came to his deathbed. And Oral Roberts says, Oh, your son has a problem with his back. He said, let me heal him. <laughs> the guy is like, touch the back of the son of this minister, instantly get healed. While he was being taken home by the Lord. He had seen Jesus multiple times. I, I think we have seen enough faces of politicians, heard enough of their voices. Some of you can memorize their speeches. But we have not seen enough of Jesus. It's about time we begin to discern Jesus in our lives, in our congregations. That's how he removes. I, I told you this in one of my teachings that I was, I was uh, complaining before the Lord because of these governors and mayors. They want to shut down churches. I was just complaining. I said, Lord, because I, you know, you, you become very upset. I was, I was feeling very upset with, with Britsker and Lightfoot. I was, I was ready to, to curse them on prayer, you know. Uh, I was I was really bad. I was I was walking back and forth here, and the Lord just dropped the thought in my heart, and He just He just put it in here very strong impression. I'm the one who closes the door, and I'm the one who opens it. Suddenly I realized they have nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, set me free. I don't hate them anymore. They have they they think they have something. They they think they are wielding power. They have nothing to do with it. I know why God closed this door and will open it later. The door had, had shut. Look, even the Catholic Church, all churches just shut down. And God just put it in my heart. I'm the one who closes the door. No one can open it. And I'm the one who opens it and no one can close it. Remember, they're talking about one year from now, some even two years from now. And Trump just simply said, this Sunday, we should open and everybody scrambled for what they're going to do. And then priest here says, no, one year. And then they were sued by the, by the pastor where we bought this church from. And he said, okay, everything is just a gesture now. Well, he thought he's in control. He's not in control. You should discern Jesus in your life. What he's doing in your life right now. You should discern him. In our church, 
what is doing in our church right now. So fear will never rule us. No, common sense should not leave us either, you know. But fear should never rule us. If it does, you're beat. You can be a phenomenal speaker, but you're beat the moment fear rules you. You should discern Jesus in your life. Amen? Well, let's all stand.